love letter to South Africa because irrespective of what I've gone through and I'm sure me and Cynthia will feel the same that South Africa has had two revolutions and we're in the middle of a second one now. The first one was of freedom. So we are the revolutionaries of the second revolution. Your enemy is wearing an Armani suit and he's signing a contract on his way out. He's going to Saxon World. <laughs> he's going to pick up his uh, bag of 200 red notes. So a democracy was sold for Armani suits and uh, bags of Well, welcome to this installment in my, what I'm calling the Alitia series, Dialogues with Whistleblowers. To kick us off, remember that famous quote, made famous by Al Gore in his documentary, The Inconvenient Truth, where he quotes Upton Sinclair saying, it is very hard to understand something if your paycheck depends on you not understanding it. Now, he did say it was hard, but not impossible. And we have a person here today who's going to talk about how she understood things, notwithstanding the massive paycheck that she was offered. As a, as a CEO of Trillion Financial Advisory by her boss, Eric Wood, and she did understand what was happening. Musila Matepu. So Musila, you see why you're such a hero of mine, because what was it that enabled you to be this wonderful exception to the rule and understand what was really happening, contrary to what your boss wanted you to know? Wow, that's an interesting question. I've always been a contrarian. I was raised in Belgium when I was eight years old. My mother was there. I didn't speak English. I didn't speak French. I was the only black person in class. So I've never been part of a gang or, so I've always had to be an independent thinker. And then having spent seven years in Belgium, being fluent in English and French, but have forgotten my mother tongue, returning to Lesotho, also now I, I'm also too white to my black friends. <laughs> so I've never enjoyed being part of the gang and especially deciding to study finance and being a woman of color, you have to fight for meaningful work. You have to fight for everything. So Eric said to me, be loyal to me and I'll reward you. But I could not be loyal when I saw the hemorrhaging, the looting of all these state-owned companies, billions of rand invoiced to ESCOM and Transnet and, and Danel. And all of these now need, are in business rescue or they need huge uh, government bailouts. Because of the nine, not wasted years, I would say the nine years of looting, of hollowing out institutions. I, I've always been an independent thinker. Plus, I've always been a Christian. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men or women, in this case, to do nothing. And as I saw South African burn and the Guptas changing finance ministers so that they can, they can sign unlawful contracts, changing boards so that they can put their people in, I had decided that I cannot allow my country to burn and I do nothing. So I had reconciled myself with my Holy Father as I was sipping Chardonnay by the Red Sea, having spent the day in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. And I, I felt emboldened, I felt inspired, and that was my moment of clarity. So I can say it's, it's a combination of many, many things. Somewhere around 2013, on a Saturday morning, breaking news, that our um, military base was used to land a private family from India. That is a, a, key, a national key point. So it was very, very weird and bizarre for a, a private family to have such access. And I think the mood of South Africa st started to change from that day. We didn't understand what was going on. At the time, 
I was happily at KPMG, having worked with Regiments, which was a black-owned company. I, I subsequently came back to Regiments in 2015, and they had the contracts with ESCOM, Transnet. This was the veins of the, of the economy, SAA. Our vanity project, I think South Africa is the f only five countries globally have an airline, a national airline, and the fleet needed to be renewed. And some private interest tried to hijack that process. And it, I'm sitting next to Cynthia here, who she essentially stopped the, the hijack. Well, welcome, Cynthia. Yeah, you, you and I have spoken a lot about your own story. You've been an enormous help to me and my clients who have come to me for support. And it's really wonderful that this mutual support system for whistleblowers is evolving. So thank you for joining me again in this dialogue. By the way, you made all the difference in my previous conversation with Aris and Shelly Ann Danikas, which, if I may alert viewers, to the link now appearing above. So Cynthia, welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you for inviting me here, and it's great to see Masilo again. Um, I'm Cynthia Stimple. I'm better known as the SAA whistleblower, and we'll talk about it more in the interview. Um, at this point, I'm just here to present um, in sharing how women, as you mentioned, have strongly, in their own role, stopped corruption in South Africa. Yeah, and, and I have got a long interview with Cynthia on my YouTube channel for folk that want to see that. You know, the link is above. By the way, if I can just invite viewers to subscribe to my YouTube channel, because once I reach 1,000 subscribers, it means I can monetize it and hopefully get some income that will enable me to reach beyond my present grasp in the support work I'm doing. Oh, back to you, Mosido. Just to say, you know, it seems that the one good thing that's come out of this dreadful state of capture political scandal is that it has precipitated a growing consciousness from highly conscientious people like yourselves. Well, the one parallel that I can think of in my own life experience is with the conscientious objection movement that got me and many of my peers realizing that we simply could not obey our call-ups to their whites-only SADF in the 80s when the country was in flames. It did mean going out on a limb, out of our comfort zone, but then things started to gain momentum. How did things play out with you? It was like a snowball effect. So I mentioned the Vatatluf lending. I mentioned a small advisory firm basically had the crown jewels of um, our economy, the state-owned companies. And I asked my bosses at the time, what is your secret? And they said they have a... This genie, if I can call him that, a business development um, partner called Salim Issa and Kumbain Moodley. And they were working with McKenzie, uh, based in the U.S. So it gave, it gave a, a black um, local firm um, gravitas to be working with, alongside McKenzie with these contracts. But everything was okay for me. And I remember one morning, um, me and Eric were the early birds. So I'm having my black coffee in his office and he, he's smiling like the cat that ate all the cream, saying, no, the president is going to fire Ntlanta Nene. Ntlanta Nene was the finance minister and he was very, very known to the capital markets. He was respected. He, he was, um, um, he stabilized the market and all of a sudden, Six weeks later, indeed, that, that what Eric told me in October 2015, he did fire the finance minister and he replaced him with a backbencher called Desmond van Rooyen. The markets were hemorrhaging. The bond yields were exploding. The rand was nosedive. There's been some analysis of how much we lost. So luckily, business and government had a meeting with the president, and he replaced Des van Rooyen with Pravin Godan, who was the, the finance minister before Ntlantanene, and the market stabilized. So by that point, I was told that one of my colleagues was going to be the, the minister's advisor, 
and he's going to be an imbimbi. He's going to be a mole at the treasury. That was the first red flag. Then I was promoted in March to, to move from regiments to trillion. And I was CEO, as you said. And I, was, I, I, I felt, wow, given South Africa's history, for a black female to head up a financial firm was incredible. My salary shot up to 2.3 million rand, um, as I said. My, I got 900,000 rand for uh, my performance bonus of over nine months. You know how impressed Mandy Wiener was with you. She quotes your challenge to journalists in the preface of her book, The Whistleblowers. And if I may quickly give another plug for another video on my YouTube channel, uh, which was hosted by Joe and Joseph with Mandy Wien and myself and a few others. The link's there as well. After you spoke at the Zonda Commission, Mandy sent this clip to the WhatsApp group that we had created, absolutely raving about it. After I, I uh, went to the public protector, my statement got leaked to the Sunday Times. What ensued were nine criminal charges that Trillian had... Um, they had a charge against me. Uh, cyber crime, fraud, theft, perjury, corruption. And it was quite shocking how I was called by the police to give a warning statement. My affidavit, he tells me that because of who these people are and the political uh, connections they have, they have, he has to expedite my case. When my lawyer went to see him, he said there was no case here. He's getting pressure from upstairs for it, for it to be moved to the MPA. And uh, it was the first time I realized that institutions can be used are used to weaponize against people who stand up for the truth. And what was also quite disappointing is that I, was at, I, I couldn't find employment after two years because South Africa doubted my integrity. Some of the banks said, um, we're not sure how this minister will react if you're part of the team. So corporate is always saying we want people of integrity, but I can say the people who have sat here with you, like Susan Daniels and myself, we are unemployed, we have lost I love you. Um, also, so I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, corporates, give us a chance. We stood up and our life has been devastated. Plus, uh, on the legislation, we need tighter legislation to protect whistleblowers. We need to protect them. We need to reward them. And I'm hoping in your recommendation, we need um, reparations. We have, I mean, I've gone to the parliamentary inquiry. I've gone to the FBI. I've gone to the NPA. I've gone to the Hawks. I've, I've gone to, I got involved in the ESCOM matter. All of this, of course, takes time. And it has an effect emotionally, psychologically. Luckily, um, I was employed at MTN for two years, but my contract ended uh, in March this year. So, but I'm using this year to just heal, write my book. And I'm just hoping that South Africa will just take the heat and say, we need better legislation, better protection, and rewards for the people who stood up for this country. That's my closing remark. Yes. Well, Masila, while you gather your thoughts about that experience and what it meant for you, Cynthia, you also gave Judge Zondo a sense of professional satisfaction when you testified. Tell us about your experience and what it meant for you. So for me, I felt exhilarated when I finished giving my evidence. I felt vindicated and I felt that for, for the first time I could speak out in public about my story with whistleblowers as much as the name um, and the connotation is that we're whistleblowing, we're having our sound out there, our voices out there, it is loud and clear. It is actually not loud and clear. 
because once you whistleblow, society, government, um, your company, you will all try to keep that whistleblower muffled, keep their voice down, try and keep them not from speaking. The day I finished, I literally felt so excited. I could actually drive for a couple of hours down to Orange Street State where I was going to be giving some yoga. And for me, I was wide awake. I was literally very exhilarated. Well, Musilo, it's no doubt that Judge Zondo was just so impressed with yourself, Bianca Goodson, and no doubt you too, Cynthia. But Musilo, how did that experience leave you feeling? Sylvia did drive to Bloemfontein. I had to, my sister had to drive me home and I just slept for, mm -hmm. for four days because mm -hmm. it was just so taxing. Um, I went to Tulima Doncella on, in September 2016. And I testified at the Zonda Commission on the 10th of December, 2020. During that four years, I was a, a what? A, a professional oath taker, affidavit. I had testified at, the, like I said, Parliament on the ESCOM inquiry. I had to meet the FBI at the American Embassy and talk about the Guptas and the money flows and Salim Issa. I had to sp speak to the Hawks. Once when I was a suspect, because I had nine criminal charges. And then when the president was, was now the president um, of the country, instead of Jacob Zuma, they turned and now they wanted me to assist them to fight the bad guys. So I met the Hawks and the FBI and the Asset Forfeiture Unit. I was supposed to be Machala Goko's first witness at his disciplinary. All of this was just too much. The mental... Anguish. I, I suffer from depression, insomnia, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety. So when I finally, four years later, after going to Tuli, I was requested to go. And they had copies of all these affidavits. I told them, I'm not mentally strong. I don't want to. And then they replied with a summons. And I didn't sleep for that whole week. And I had to take medication. Like, I've got this take only on emergency. So for me, it wasn't a good experience the first time. And I think after that, then I slept for four days because I hadn't slept before then. And then I didn't even enjoy Christmas because I was summoned again to testify on ESCOM early January. I was a little bit more relaxed, and, but still my sleeping patterns was just very, very um, erratic and I was exhausted. I am proud of the contribution that um, I made at the Zonda Commission, I'm, but I'm, I, I hope that it's not in vain because there's so much evidence. And you know, Ms. Shamila Bitoy should, should be getting her boys ready. We need some of these people uh, to take account for what they've done. But it was Advocate Tuli Madoncella who really became all-important to you to enable you to emerge from that dark cave of despair, fear, anxiety and doubt. Well, tell us about your relationship with her. Oh, Tuli is such a remarkable woman. She's a woman of stature, of she's eth ethical, her integrity is beyond measure. So I think, had, had we had a different public protector... I wonder where the country would be today. Say something about the role of the media. You were rather shocked to see your name suddenly appearing on the front page of the Sunday Times after an affidavit you submitted it found its way into the hands of journalists. There's a misconception that it was that statement was from the from the public protector. It wasn't. I had a CCMA case with my lawyers. I had two statements. And the the statement that was given to the Sunday Times, not leaked, was my CCMA case, which Tuli didn't have. And it was leaked on the weekend where the state of capture report was interdicted. So somebody at Werksman's decided, this country is burning, and we, if we know how slow the legal system is, for, so they were thinking she will have to be collateral damage because her statement is state capture. So if we don't have the public protector's report, we will have Musilo's statement on the front cover of Sunday Times. So you say it was your, somebody from your own legal team? It was. 
Well, that raises the issue about how journalists and lawyers take risks with whistleblower testimonies. But I hope they've apologised to you and learned their lessons. Well, what happened to the sacred uh, client privilege of, of a, a lawyer? The role of the media after that, and even at that stage, because they, the, the, the journalist who wrote that article incorporated in GBC Jonas's story that in October uh, 2015, he was offered the role as finance minister. And on the 26th of October, he was sitting with um, Dan telling him at his balcony that the Guptas had just offered him 600 million rand and 600,000 rand in a bag for him to be finance minister, but he has to work with them. That was exactly the same time that Eric was telling me that the president was going to find Tantanene. Well, the tail must never be allowed to wag the dog, as I sit with my dog here on my lap. The media must serve the common good, and for the most part, my experience with journalists has been extremely positive. But the best criticism of the bad is, of course, the practice of the better. Now, in your book, you talk about two journalists who really showed other journalists how things should be done. Sikunati Mantancha was one. You know, Sikonati Manjancha was the first journalist that I approached. Every journalist had approached me and I, I declined to, to be interviewed by them. But I saw his work when he was the deputy editor of Business Day and Financial Mail, that he was really, really investigating the rot at ESCOM and exposing the corruption. So I called him and we had coffee and I said, listen, um, this is me, and I would like to assist you, right? And I want to bring uh, more truth to your, to your story and give you an insider's perspective of ESCOM and Trillian's relationship. And he wrote an article subsequently in April 2018 about me, um, saying essentially the price of integrity in South Africa. Musilo Mutepu took a bullet for us. And we are paying her back with bankruptcy. So he wrote about my, mine and I think many other uh, journey of whistleblowers, the isolation, the loneliness. We are unemployable. So I was, I was about to sell my house in three months. And I said, I, I'm, I'm standing here alone and I'm, I feel isolated. And that resulted in Rob uh, Shooter, then the CEO of MTN, offering me a three million a year contract. And then the president of the Republic calling me, saying, I got your number from Sigonati Manjanja. We hear you, we're here for you. But I would also like to focus on another journalist, Jessica Behosenholt. Apologies for the mispronunciation. Yes, I didn't do, yes, I did French and Afrikaans. <laughs> but she was there from the beginning. I was at the CCMA um, and they, they were, Trillion's lawyers were in the left, but so were the journalists. Mm -hmm. And Stainscop's partner said to the HR lady at Trillion, don't worry, we're going to bleed her dry. And indeed they tried, because my legal bill was 1.3 million rand. Mm -hmm. So it was lawful. Mm -hmm. They opposed everything, Stalingrad. She wrote an article, how to bleed a whistleblower dry. Pluff read it from Paris. They flew down and they squashed it. And from the Trillion leaks, they were bled dry. Trillion spent 18 million rand mm -hmm. legal fees mm -hmm. trying to fight me. So yeah. they were bled dry, unfortunately. But Eric must have skipped his Sunday school classes because he doesn't know the, the story of David and Goliath. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cynthia, how does, how does that tell you with your own experience with lawyers and journalists? Thanks, John. So my experience with the media at the time, I must say, overall was positive. Um, the one thing, though, right up front, when my story broke into the media, the media put up a title, Defiant Treasurer. And so that remains there. If you have to Google my name, you're going to see that Defiant Treasurer title. And so it has an impact when you're applying for a job, and that's the negative side of it. But when I read of how they write about other whistleblowers or other stories that should be told in certain ways, 
there's there's a dual side to it. The one is is truthful up front and exacting the detail. On the other hand, you have media like the Bell Pottinger, the type of issues they want to bring out mm. so they can garner a different type of narrative in the media. And that, for me, is where we all need to be very, very careful around mm. um, what we read, how we read it, and then find that truth and authenticity in those um, mm. journalists. Regarding the lawyers, <laughs> I feel that the lawyers in South Africa right now and over the period do not understand the Protected Disclosures Act fully. And therefore, when anyone has whistleblown, the first thing they do is take up the Labor Relations Act. And you're fighting in court, Labor Court or you, the CCMA regarding labor issues. The Protected Disclosures Act firmly states that you have um, you are protected against occupational debt money, and it's obligatory uh, to the employer and employee to speak out for any wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. And so we just being honest and open and doing our job, or when we seeing any wrongdoing, we speaking about it, reporting it and we suffer the detriment. Um, we as whistleblowers have decided to put the, mm. the challenges regarding the Protected Disclosures Act forward to the media, to right. Zonda Commission, to Department of Justice, to the Department of, uh, of Labor, because this act needs to change and make sure that it does work for whistleblowers. Thank you. If I may just say that I'm hoping that this series of dialogues will also help better educate my own professional colleagues as to what role they can play to provide emotional support to whistleblowers to help them own their stories. In fact, the term psychosocial support means that we need to integrate and combine the psycho part, which is about the, the inner experience, or the socio bit is about helping the family process what's going on, but also linking our clients appropriately with formal state structures and social institutions. Well, my personal mission is to try and help ensure a good connection for my clients to good journalists and good lawyers to ensure that there's a robustness uh, in that triangulation. Because in the broader context of this country, we really do face still a long journey back from, from that wilderness that we're in. But both of you have now written books. How are you feeling now about that responsibility that comes with having been now an author of your own destiny? Wow, it's, um, <laughs> it's incredible. I've gone through this journey for, for five years. And during this time, I had been offered a million rand advance to write my book. And I was in hell. I was still being refined. I was still dealing with myself. And I declined to write the book. Because I had I didn't understand but what what was what is the purpose of this journey in my life. So there was no learnings to share with everybody. Everybody knew I was suffering. Everybody knew I was unemployed. Everybody knew I was fighting nine criminal charges. So I write a book based and say what? I ask God, it was a Sunday, I ask him, Lord, help me understand, give me a revelation. And he says, I want you to write a book about my glory, about conviction. I took you to the wilderness, I showed you my miracles, and I prepared your heart for this journey. But you suffered, you were stripped of everything you held dear. But you stayed on your course, you stayed true to your course, and I want you to write a story about the strength, the resilience of the human spirit. I feel so, so, so proud of myself. Penguin was very excited when I made the announcement in January 2020 that um, I have decided to write a book I did finance, so I had a ghostwriter, Kate Sidley. It was a soothing process. I, I still, today, still see my trauma counselor a weekly and my psychiatrist. And they warned me that you're going to open scabs and they're going to start bleeding again. And indeed, there, were, there was a, a we used to meet um, 
me and Kate Sedley. We used to exchange um, houses, so and we used to warm each other up with homemade soup. Mm. So we wrote it in four months. For me, it was, I call it my love letter to South Africa. Mm. Because I feel, irrespective of what I've gone through, to anything that, is, that you bestow dear requires sacrifice. And I'm sure me and Cynthia will feel the same, that South Africa has had two revolutions. And we're in the middle of a second one now. The first one was of freedom. It was a minority of people. Every single black colored Indian mother did not want the son daughter to join the movement. Stay in your lane. You must speak Afrikaans. You must take your dompas. Compliance. But it took a handful of brave people to say absolutely not. We're rejecting this um, system. Even if it costs our, our lives, we're going to change it. And then 24 years later, 23 years later, those same revolutionaries have, have now sold our democracy to three Indian brothers. So we are the revolutionaries of the second revolution. And the revolution now is not in the trenches in Angola. It's in the boardrooms of ESCOM, as Transnet, as SAA. Your enemy is wearing an Armani suit. And he's signing a contract. On his way out, he's going to Saxon World. He's going to pick up his uh, bag of 200 red notes. So a democracy was sold for Armani suits and uh, bags of cash. So I feel good that I can share my story, and especially to women and girls to say, you know, as I said, um, this woman is 1 meter 58 centimeters, childlike hands, three and a half size shoes, but she took on a corrupt system and government, mm -hmm. and she won. And I'm not of ANC blood, I'm not of royalty, I have no protection, mm -hmm. but I decided to do something. I had conviction, mm -hmm. and you need to stand up for something, and, if, and that is what my story hopefully uh, relays to. Key, and well, thanks Musilo. Uh, that is just so empowering. Speaking truth to power, especially the really inconvenient truths, is almost by definition going to bring you into conflict. And this is not just in South Africa, globally. I mean, I was listening to a conversation recently between the well-known historian Yuval Noah Harari and a Harvard political philosopher Michael Sandel, and they agreed that people who are interested in power and people who are interested in truth will tend to move in opposite directions. They remarked that no politician would ever get elected if he swore the same oath that the two of you had to swear before Judge Zonda, because the political system is just really not amenable to truth. But President Ramaphosa is now showing a far greater receptivity to listening to whistleblower accounts. In fact, Masili, you talk about how you've even got his ear and that he's phoned you as well and is, has been on the Zonda Commission himself encouraging whistleblowers to come forward. How are you dealing with that responsibility, Mosilo, that comes from being a published author and becoming a little bit famous? What advice do you have for Cynthia? <laughs> okay, I'm, I, uh, I, thank you, John. I'm, that's an honor. Um, I think when we, dis both of us, we just thought, blow the whistle, continue on, get another job, life goes on. Nine to five, nine to five. But God has chosen a different path. That you say we're whistleblowers. I say no. When we are brave, we are warriors, we are heroes, we are triumphant. And we, we didn't just do the right thing and, and fade into obscurity and just going back to nine to five. God said, no, my child, I'm putting you aside. You are going to live to tell your tale. And that is immortality for us. Cynthia, you Thank tell you, us. Masilo. Well, Cynthia and yourself, uh, what have you got from reading Masilo's book that will be useful to you as you prepare for your book release? What, a few months' time? Thanks, John, for that question. Yes, so my book is almost complete, so there's nothing I can do to change it right now. We're just in the final uh, proofreading stages. But having read Masilo's book, I was encouraged at the journey she took, the journey she had to walk alone, because most times... Um, after you've whistleblown, you, it's a lonely journey. It's a journey that you're carrying this heavy burden, either feeling guilt or feeling self-doubt 
or all these other type of questions hit your mind and you yourself have to cleanse yourself from it and firmly tell yourself, I did the right thing. And once you're through that, you still walk that journey to the end alone and only once you've reached that stage of vindication do you feel the relief. So with hers, I found she had a long journey which really um, impacted her life in all spheres. It impacts even your relationship with your friends, your family, Mm -hmm. your loved ones. And um, we can never quantify it. The way I see it, and especially having read Masilo's book, you just, the tip of the iceberg is what's out in the media. And the rest of that iceberg is what that whistleblower experiences alone on that journey. Mm And what strongly comes out in the book is her faith, and I I can fully relate and resonate with it because it was my faith journey that got me through this. It was my trust in God. It was my absolute faith that He will carry me and take me through the fire of hell, through the darkness, Mm -hmm. through climbing all the hills. Um, I sensed the same when I read Masila's book, that she had that true faith and trust to carry her through. Well, there's a vast subterranean aquifer of information out there waiting to come up that will cleanse our society from this contagion of corruption. But the point about both your narratives is that it clearly strikes me that you did a simultaneous journey inward. You undertook your own hero's journey, as the famous Joseph Campbell writes about in his classic book, Hero with a Thousand Faces. He says... We do not have to risk the adventure alone, for the heroes of all time have gone before us. Where we have thought to travel outward, we shall come to the center of our own existence. Now, that's what's just so lovely to see people finding that inner sense of transformation. Now, it doesn't mean that every whistleblower is going to write a book or needs to write a book, but... Every whistleblower needs somebody that's going to accompany and support them on their hero's journey. Be it a social worker, a pastor, a mentor, coach, or preferably all of them, so that you can own your own stories, warts and all, and then get to that solid foundation of the house that's built on rock rather than on sand. Or, Cynthia, to use your metaphor of the iceberg again, Whistleblowers need people who are willing to do a deep dive with them to get below the surface of what's publicly known through the media and through the courts into what isn't known. And I say that for the benefit of other potential whistleblowers who might be watching this and whose own inner whistleblowers wanting to come out so that they would be encouraged to do so. But once that journey inward happens, there needs to be that simultaneous journey outward And Judge Zonda was clearly committed to ensuring that there is complete overall of the Protected Disclosures Act and was very impressed by all of you who have testified before him. And I will say to you what I said to Ms. Mkepo when she appeared before the Commission. I am very interested in looking at the adequacy or otherwise of protection for whistleblowers in South Africa. And uh, it seems to me that uh, providing a lot of protection to whistleblowers is a critical pillar to a meaningful fight against corruption. If you have a very good regime of protection of whistleblowers as a country, you stand a good chance that people who want to blow the whistle when they are aware of corruption will find it easy to do so. It will contribute to a deterrence. Those who get involved in corruption must know that when the whistle has been blown by somebody, the law enforcement agencies have a good chance of doing a proper job to investigate and to catching them. And then the third thing is that they will be prosecuted and if found guilty, sent to jail. If any of these pillars is weak. It compromises the fight against corruption. And just as I invited Ms. Munchepo, I would invite you and anyone else listening or watching who would like to make submissions as to the adequacy or otherwise of our regime for the protection of whistleblowers and um, what 
proposals can be made to the Commission to say this is what it should propose, should change in the law or in some practices so that in the report we could have a section that deals with how the pillar of protection of whistleblowers can be strengthened. So you, you can also make a contribution by sending submissions to the Commission. We're wrapping up. In response to Judge Zonda's invitation for submissions from the public at large, what do you think I need to cover in my submission, bearing in mind that social workers must also resist that temptation of becoming the tail that wags the dog? I, I had a webinar yesterday with um, Jane Turner. She's an FBI whistleblower. Mm. And she, she knows um, the, the, the lawyer that wrote the American legislation. And I've, invite, I've requested if she can contact him so he can make a submission to Zondo. Because I remember at the beginning of the commission, there were three Americans who defined state capture. Mm. And I think that the American law has, I think it's the best in the world with regards to the protection, the, the rewards, and the legislation. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very excited that um, my submission will be to contact mm -hmm. him and, and himself to, to, to make a submission to Zondo. So that, because, because we keep saying the legislation is not adequate, so now we need to say, but what is adequate? Let us look at a first-class system. Those pillars inspired me to suggest that as much as there's a legal pillar, the media is another pillar. It needs to be a safe harbour for whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. and, and then for us professionals, helping professionals, we need to be there to provide psychosocial support. For me, I wrote this book and it's raw. You said the tip of the iceberg. Um, I talk about my nervous breakdown. I talk about my mental health. I talk about shaking. I even... There was a time where I loved peas. <laughs> I, there was a time I, I couldn't eat peas because I was shaking so much they would fall off my, <laughs> my plate. And then I said, my God, this whole thing has taken so much from me, even my favorite vegetable. You have Plough who could write off 1.3 million check to Verksman's, but they could not give me 50 rand to buy bread. They couldn't pay for my psychologist. Um, I was lucky enough to still be on medical aid, but within about three three months, um, I think when you have um, trauma, they say no, you'll get how many sessions a, a year. So I, I I had to see them every every week. So I mean I spent four hundred twenty thousand rand last year on and the year before on my mental health and physical health. I, my, I can write a, a book on how, how trauma affects you mentally, emotionally, and physically. So we need that part. That's where you guys step in. The, the support, or I call it the, the aftermath, because people get divorced. People drink more. I mean, there was a chapter in my book where I have wine for breakfast to numb the pain of being unemployed mm -hmm. and having to sit at home for eight mm -hmm. hours and listen to my neighbors' cars go in, out, and my sin is I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. So, I, as in, in as much as we talk about the law protecting us, we but we also have to understand the other softer services of the psychologist, the social worker, um, the friendship circle. I was alone, and in my book, I I say Ivan Pele and Yoli Biki. They said when they were kicked out of SARS by Tom Munyane. They decided to meet and wash every single morning and they'll have coffee, all, all of them, because they knew if we don't do this, we are going to go into a spiral of depression, of alcoholism, of suicide. Mm -hmm. And it, so they said, you have no one to do that with. Come and join us. So the brotherhood. So we need to have a conversation about the support that is softer, that will make the journey a little bit more bearable. And sometimes when you've gone through trauma, you can't relate to your, your family or your husband. Hi, love, what's wrong? 
No, I just went to see the FBI today. <laughs> <laughs> they, like, they can't even... But uh, Sylvia, did you also see the FBI? Oh, yes, I did as well. Like, how do you feel? No, let's have wine. Let's discuss it. Oh, my God. And then when we see that that meeting resulted in the sanctions, we call each other. Oh, my God. Mm. You know, for, for, for somebody... Who, who doesn't understand, no, it's okay, that's just a breaking news. We, we were there. We were there. So it's, it's the highs, the lows, and, and I think just like when you have, maybe if you lost a child or you've gotten divorced or you, you're a cancer survivor, you need to be around others who they've gone through the journey with you. So there's so much more that we can, we can do for each other as society. Cynthia, how do you see your role now going forward? Because both of you have struggled to find employment in my sense that you've both acquired a skill set that almost renders you unemployable. The organization that would find your skills useful doesn't really exist yet because your life experience is now almost over the horizon of maybe a few NGOs, civil society organizations, but they're all struggling for funding. I mean, people have mentioned Outer, Corruption Watch, and others, but there's no doubt that you know a whistleblowing culture is now needed that actually does ensure that everyone's interests are served by truth. Exactly, John, and you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, as Masilo was speaking, it was exactly that, that you learn there isn't someone else you can meet and talk to. When I was suspended at SAA, there were four other people suspended around within months of my suspension. And we did exactly that. We met sort of on a regular basis, firstly to share our stories, because what comes up, the company posts um, a general email to all the staff, which is different to what really happened. And when I listened to each of the people's stories, I realized the company was obviously not telling the truth regarding why we all did what we did when we got suspended. And so that was part of the the start of my journey for me, just listening to other people's stories and realizing the importance of sharing your story with another person who was in the same boat as you. Or rather, I would say the same storm. We're all in our different boats, but the same storm of what's hitting us. And then what got me to, it was more after my giving testimony at Zondo was reaching out to other whistleblowers and whistleblowers reaching out to me and that's when we started a support group but via WhatsApp whereby we met on two occasions during the time as a as a larger group but many of us met on one on one with one another just to chat to find out what your story is and the WhatsApp would be more your, your jokes or you posting your frustration for the day and there's always someone in the group that can either identify right. with it or write a positive message and it was that type of support and that then grew into where we are today, opening citizens of conscience. But as you rightly say, there is a need now for more whistleblowers. If we're looking at a country that we want to reduce our corruption, we're going to need a more ethical society. And to create that, it means you're going to need to start at a young level, at schools. Well, already families in their homes set the bar for ethics. But when you get to school and there's a, a bully it diminishes the will to speak up or the need to speak up. A company or an agency or an ombudsman is very much needed. We've got enough people now talking about the legislation, so I'm almost comfortable it will be worked on, and we will just make sure and point in the, that they and remind them to do it. On the other hand is how do you build the pillars, the support structure? On social work... Um, the trauma counseling, the uh, psychological assistance, the psychiatric assistance, that is definitely needed. The other part is the financial assistance, so that's another pillar, because it's not about um, just getting a job now, what's going to keep give your dignity back? Because it's what we need. We've lost that dignity, that sort of self-assurance, the self-confidence, mm. and how do we then ensure that we can take it forward. So one of our, our pillars is looking at setting up a, fun, um, a whistleblowing fund mm. and finding and working on the criteria of how do we disperse the funds for each of those whistleblowers. If you think of people like Lennox Garana, who really got to a point of frustration where he committed suicide in Parliament. It was such a statement, but he's left behind a mother and children. 
who takes care of them now? The wife is suffering from psychological damage for that. But is anyone taking care of her? No. For that reason, it's it's beyond just what we suffered now. It's all the people that have already whistleblown years ago and everyone's forgotten about them. So it's going to be bigger than us and it's going to require every citizen in South Africa to want to work towards this. Thank you. You mean even pale males like me who are feeling like we're going stale? Definitely, <laughs> definitely. I'm joking about that because in one of our previous episodes uh, in the series, I, I got Andrew Feinstein and Roland Hunter to sit down in this lounge to reflect on the experience of people of my demographic. He was a young conscript in the whites-only SADF, and he found himself working as a, as a clerk in military intelligence and came across information that showed that the SADF was involved in destabilizing the surrounding countries. And he then knew this had to get out, and he was able to leak it to the ANC in exile, unfortunately got caught, and were facing the death penalty for treason. But fortunately, Judge, uh, she was then advocate, Kathy Satchwell, was able to get them off by threatening to put put Boerter on the stand, and he knew that he wouldn't purge himself. So that, but he spent five years in jail. So I, asked, I interviewed them in that interview to say, guys, what has been your experience that we can contribute to help people to ensure that you don't have to go through the same trauma? So people must watch that. It's a very useful information. And the interesting connection between whistleblowers there is that Roland is Rosemary Hunter's brother. So you can see within that family, there was a culture of people who start saying, truth matters, we must speak truth over tribe. And the point about also that Andrew Feinstein made in that interview was that it was a whistleblower inside the ANC who came to him as a member of parliament of the ANC in his capacity as a ranking member of the ANC in the SCOPA, in the Special Committee on Public Accounts, and blew the whistle about the arms deal. Andrew said it's only himself and I think two other people that know who the identity of those whistleblowers were. And now, finally, 22 years later or so, we are getting to have President Jacob Zuma still on charges of what happened there because of a whistleblower. Like the Gupta leaks. Exactly. The Stan Gupta and leaks John. Leaks. We don't know yeah, that and Thank you. So I wanted to just signal that to say that there is, in fact, a culture of whistleblowing it is still there, think it's and how do we amplify it? Mm -hmm. I mean, in 2010, sadly, ODAC folded. It was Alison Tilly had established this as an excellent support system, and on my video channel there is a three stories, wonderful stories of whistleblowers, from 2003 to 2008. So this is before the state capture. Mm -hmm. So we do have a lovely body of knowledge. And by way of just saying in closing to you, in tribute to both of you, there are two thoughts. One is more personal and the other is professional. Well, the professional one I think I've ex explained. It's a, as a social worker, I can now see an opportunity to contribute our skill set. And I can't wait to get my draft to the both of you to look at, to see how I am proposing a policy framework that would hopefully lead to some sort of specialised, maybe Chapter 9 type institution that actually is staffed not just by lawyers, I mean, I think we can abide a few of them, but people like myself who are psychosocially trained, who can help people at that level, who can then do that job of making sure that people are supported, like they have, for example, in the Netherlands. They have a house. And I will elaborate how specifically some of the experience I've had of how to ensure that the fundamental human needs system of people are not left so impoverished that they end up basically cracking up. So that's at the professional level. At the personal spiritual level, as I was listening to the two of you, another woman came to mind who in a sense was a whistleblower, whose life actually exemplifies exactly what you've done. And she said words to the effect, she says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon me as his lowly servant, he has cast down the mighty from the thrones. He has lifted up the lowly. And, from, and the hungry will now be fed with good things. Now, you know who I'm talking about. You're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, in some countries, that passage is banned. 
by the government because they don't want people to cast the mighty down from their thrones. So I feel a little bit of a sense of that spirit of Mary, the mother of Jesus, being willing to offer her life for the purpose of bringing truth to bear in a situation. So thank you for that, and thank you for giving me a huge boost and encouragement to my faith. And I'm going to see your book as number two on the bestseller list of nonfiction after the Bible soon. Oh, yes. <laughs> Amen to that. Yes. <laughs> thank you.